The past, I don't know, five years or so of life in the social network has already been very transforming. Facebook, among others, has disrupted ordinary life as we know it, life in the office, personal life, life on our cell phones, and it's connected us with hundreds of people that we know personally, uh, from school and our neighbors and our friends and ordinary life, and with hundreds, perhaps even thousands more people that we don't know personally, but who we may share common interests with, or who may thumbs up our post or like or watch something that we do. And it's just already radically changed things in many respects. But that's just the very beginning, because the idea of a social network is about to take on a profoundly radical change that could just that could make everything else we've seen on the internet so far seem meaningless. And this new era is just beginning. It's just taking off. And the potential for this radical change is just immediately evident if you let sink in what's going on. And these changes are just taking hold. For the first time, researchers at Cornell University have linked up the brains of multiple people using brain-to-brain interfaces so they can collaborate and work on specific problems. In the case of this study, the problem was to win at the game of Tetris. And so they linked up three people, and they're calling this system BrainNet. These researchers say we present BrainNet, which to our knowledge is the first multi-person, non-invasive, direct brain-to-brain interface for collaborative problem solving. The interface combines electroencephalography, that's EEG, to record brain signals and transcranial magnetic stimulation to deliver information non-invasively to the brain. Now that part they've been able to do for many years, but they're starting to really use it in a targeted way. They write the interface allows three human subjects to collaborate and solve a task using direct brain-to-brain communication. Two of the three subjects are senders whose brain signals are decoded using real-time EEG data analysis. Now if you've seen the film The Minds of Men, That's one of the most important points that emerged out of the study of cybernetics and out of the study of the brain and the attempt to modify it. The ability to use real-time EEG data analysis to read the brain and to write the brain. In chimpanzee Batty, brain waves telemetered from the left and right amygdala were received and automatically analyzed by an online analog computer. This instrument was instructed to recognize a specific pattern of waves. The computer was also instructed to activate a stimulator. Each time the waves appeared, radio signals were sent to Patty's brain to stimulate a point known to have negative reinforcing properties. Electrical stimulation of one cerebral structure was contingent upon specific EEG patterns in another area of the brain. Here they're using the decoding of real-time EEG data analysis to extract decisions about whether to rotate a block in a Tetris-like game before it's dropped to fill in a line. I'm sure everybody knows how the game works. The sender's decisions are transmitted via the internet to the brain of a third subject, the receiver, who cannot see the game screen. The decisions are delivered to the receiver's brain via magnetic stimulation of the occipital cortex. The receiver integrates the information received and makes a decision using EEG interface about whether to turn the block or keep it in the same position. And in a second round, they have a chance to validate and say, was that what you meant to do here? Yes or no, and they can confirm and they used five different groups of these three people, and they had an overall accuracy in this study of 81.3%. They pretty much got it right. They did pretty well, and I'm sure they have the capability of improving over time. They also ran a variable where they interjected artificial noise into one of the sender signals, and they found that the receiver was able to even discern between which of the two senders was more reliable and which one they trusted more. And chillingly, These Cornell researchers conclude that their results raise the possibility of a future brain-to-brain interface that enables cooperative problem-solving by humans using a social network of connected brains. That's the social network of the future. And here's a report on it in Science Alert. And this just came out in the last couple days, so this is brand new. And so as the two senders are deciding what decisions to make in Tetris as they watch the game screen, they're asked to look at 
one of two flashing LEDs at the side of their computer screen, one flashing at 15 hertz and the other at 17 hertz, which produces a transmagnetic cranial stimulation signal in the brain that's then translated into EEG brain waves, and then that is sent over the internet to the receiver. So they're already doing this. And so BrainNet is specifically designed to work over the internet. It works even across the web. So they do have to have some kind of prosthetic EEG cap they put on and some kind of machine that modifies the brain waves according to the decision. But once they have that, the <laughs> people can connect and communicate non-verbally just through their brains over the internet. In spite of space or time or even language barriers, people will theoretically be able to work together in a group communication using their minds alone. And that is the literal definition of a hive mind. We've heard about the coming of a hive mind. This is one giant step forward for mankind towards no longer being human and becoming something else. Definition one, the property of apparent sentience in a colony of social insects acting as a single organism. Each insect performing a specific role for the good of the group. Second definition, a collective consciousness analogous to the behavior of social insects in which a group of people become aware of their commonality and think and act as a community sharing their knowledge, thoughts, and resources. And they use as an example the global hive mind that's emerged with Twitter and Facebook. Just a metaphor, right? And the second part of that definition, such a group mentally characterized by uncritical conformity and a loss of sense of individuality and personal accountability. Well, that's the danger, isn't it? But the scientists at Cornell are, of course, not the only people working on it. Melissa reported on this several months ago with the work of Regina Dugan and Facebook in their Building 8 Research Collective, where they're working on some very serious and far-reaching uh, futuristic technological things. They've been working for at least a couple years now on a device that they plan to use that would allow people to type out words using a brain-computer interface. And if it goes according to plan, they would strap something onto the head, some kind of prosthetic device, and it would use an optical technique to decode the speech based on optically reading neurons inside your brain non-invasively and then translating those into speech, into letters and words, and they are hoping to get to the point where it can reach 100 words a minute, which is much faster than they can do now. And they're going to use a variety of infrared light reading technology because the brain uh, works partially based on photons, or at least photons have been shown to modify the brain. And so the use of these light waves can quickly and accurately read brain waves. And they're hoping that even if they can't get to the point right away of typing 100 words a minute based on interpreting the part of your brain that sends speech <laughs> into your vocal organs that they can at least master a yes or no click or don't click function that they say would be basically a brain mouse and so facebook is attempting to create a mind reading device so its users can think their facebook posts directly into the platform without having to type anything what if you could type directly from your brain. It sounds impossible, but it's closer than you may realize. We're talking about decoding those words, the ones you've already decided to share by sending them to the speech center of your brain. In a few years time, we expect to demonstrate a real time silent speech system capable of delivering 100 words per minute. So Facebook and Regina Dugan, who's a very interesting character, if you're not familiar with her, I won't spoil it for you, you can look up. We've done a number of videos on her over the years. They're very much involved in some very serious technology. They are connected to DARPA and the military projects. It's very clandestine and covert on one side of it. And it's very much technology in Silicon Valley on the other side of it. And they're creating a path to a future that very few, if any of us, saw coming. And very few, if any of us, are going to be readily adapted to. Yes, they can use it for people who have disabilities, who can't talk, who can't communicate. Yes, they can use it to efficiently get work done and possibly make people's lives better. But at what cost? At what cost is this technology going to eat into, first of all, the freedom inside of our brain, the last remaining freedom 
that Orwell talked about in 1984. When they have everything else in society controlled, when it's regimented, when they watch you on telescreens, when the people you interact with spy on you, when everything you do is tracked and traced and cataloged, you know, you still at least have the freedom inside your brain. Or at least you did up until the point that Orwell wrote that in 1948 and the year that he projected in 1984. But today, your quote unquote cognitive liberty the freedom inside your brain is very much under threat. It's being eroded day by day in studies like this. And on the one hand, it's incredible what they could do with technology. On the other hand, <laughs> I mean, they're, they are now linking people's brains up to work in a collective, literally to work in a hive mind. And they're looking forward and saying this, this activity is the next generation of social networks. The new social network is one of connected brains, directly connected brains interacting over the internet. They've already unleashed the smart home and the internet of things where your appliances and your devices and your electronics talk to each other and they share data to work as a collective. Now they're going to be getting human beings working in offices from home as individuals, as social creatures, working together in groups as a collective on common problems or things of common interest through their brain waves. They're going there, people. It's happening. This is the first major step that I've seen. Uh, certainly, they've been working on it for a while, but this is the first tangible step, and they believe it's the first, where they've got multiple people linked up in a brain-to-brain -brain interface working over the web on a common problem. And just to give you a hint of how long this has been in the works and how long some people in the know have seen this coming, I just want to point out a quote from a speech by Sir Charles Sherrington, who we talked about in the Minds of Men film. He was the mentor to Dr. Wilder Penfield, who really started probing the brain for the first time, using electrical signals to stimulate the brain, to resurrect memories. Wilder Penfield had become Sir Sherrington's most distinguished pupil. Penfield trained at Oxford under a Rhodes Scholarship. It was Sherrington who introduced Penfield to neurology and Penfield dedicated all his books to his mentor. Uh, his mentor, Sir Charles Sherrington, gave a speech uh, that he titled The Brain and Its Mechanisms all the way back to 1934, and he concludes this speech on page 34 and 35 with this paragraph. I reflect with apprehension that a great subject can revenge itself shrewdly for being too hastily touched. To the question of the relation between brain and mind, the answer given by a physiologist 60 years ago was ignorabimus. They didn't know, they were ignorant. But today, less than yesterday, do we think the definite limits of exploration yet attained. The problem I have too grossly touched today has one virtue at least. It will long offer to those who pursue it, that is brain research, the comfort that to journey is better than to arrive, but that comfort assumes arrival. Some of us, perhaps because we are too old, or is it too young, think there may be a rival at last. And when, and if that arrival comes, there may still be regret that the pursuit is over. If only for this, that man, the best among us, having found how the brain does its thinking, will certainly try to improve its ways of doing so, restraining some parts, amplifying others, introducing shortcuts, and certainly increasing speed and aiming at economy, and devising as it seems to him best. And here's the conclusion that just chills me, and I, I've known about this quote for years, and it's just chilled me every time I think about it. We need not be prophets to foresee that then will come the long-told speedy extinction of man once they've conquered the brain. The planet will then be re-liberated, free for the next era of animal domination. May I be forgiven for mentioning the hope that the new dominant may not be anything of the social insect type. May one of the great pioneers of brain research, who started this whole track going, some of it at least through secret societies, may he be forgiven for mentioning the hope that the new dominant species, which will not be man, which will not be human, may not be anything of the social insect type. Well, they are exactly building today a social insect type, which is known as a hive mind. Presumably, it will be something of a human species, but a transhuman species, one which interacts as a hive mind, 
social insects acting as a single organism to perform specific roles for the good of the group. What have they done in this study? They've got two senders and a receiver working together in a group in their respective roles as a collective brain, as a hive mind, to achieve the task at hand. Social insects. 